Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Rustein. I'm a plastic surgeon here at UCLA. I specialize in aesthetic surgery and uh, rhinoplasty, and I'm here to talk to you about um, the modern approach to rhinoplasty and what every patient should know. So um, feel free to follow us at uh, Twitter at uh, UCLA Health, and uh, if you have any questions, um, please tweet them uh, using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. So today I want to go over the modern approach to rhinoplasty. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of rhinoplasty and the broad categories within the uh, field. I want to go over some of the modern techniques and technology that, have been, that I've been involved with with my uh, research. Uh, I want to try to help you decide whether rhinoplasty may be the right procedure for you. Go over some of the top rhinoplasty questions that I get from my patients. Uh, you'll get a chance to see some of my before and afters and uh, we'll wrap it up with some main takeaways and then answer some questions for you. So rhinoplasty, commonly known as nose job, um, has been around for um, you know, many years since 500 BC. Uh, it was actually one of the oldest procedures performed in plastic surgery. Um, and actually, interesting story, in India, uh, nasal mutilation was a form of punishment and there's a surgeon reconstructing the nose using the forehead skin. And believe it or not, we still do that procedure today. Uh, it's widely considered one of the most difficult operations we do in plastic surgery. I think this really has to do with the uh, form and the function of the nose. Uh, the function being your nasal breathing, which is obviously important. But the nose also, it's, it's a very central feature on your face. Uh, and we really have to sculpt the structure of your nose and every millimeter counts. And every nose requires different techniques. Just like every face is different, every nose is different. We really want to emphasize uh, making your, your nose fit your face. Um, and, and today, basically, rhinoplasty has now become the second most common cosmetic surgical procedure with over 220,000 procedures performed in the U.S. just last year, according to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Um, so if you're considering rhinoplasty, you're really, you're really not alone. <clears throat> so what are the different categories of rhinoplasty procedures? There's cosmetic versus functional. There's open versus closed and primary versus secondary. And secondary is really revision rhinoplasty. And I'm, I'm going to go over each of these in detail. So cosmetic rhinoplasty is really rhinoplasty for appearance. You just feel like your nose doesn't fit your face. It could be either too large or even too small at times. Or your nose can be misshapen, crooked, or misaligned. Uh, and these are all reasons that people come in for, for cosmetic rhinoplasty. And when you come in for a cosmetic rhinoplasty, we really want to take a look at, the, at how your nose fits your face again. And, and these are just some uh, basic drawings of how we analyze the face. And when we look at you in the frontal view, we try to uh, break up your face into fifths. And uh, as you can see here, we want the width of your nose to roughly equal the width of your eye. And so your nose should really fall into the medial border, the inside border of, of your eyes. Um, and then when we look on the side view, we really want your, we look at uh, your face, we break it up into thirds, and the middle third is where your nose lies, and it's from your brow to the bottom of your nose, and that should equal the upper third, which is basically your forehead, and your lower third, which is from your nose down to your chin. And these are all about getting the right proportions, which is a, an important point uh, in facial aesthetic surgery, and specifically rhinoplasty. And here's an example of a patient here who was unhappy with their profile view, and uh, really the nose was great, and we just needed to put an a implant in the chin, get her lower third proportion right, and, and um, give her a, a nicer uh, profile. Compared to this patient where she had a, um, a hump on her, on her nose that she wasn't happy with, and we're able to get that down for her and, and give her a nicer uh, profile view while still maintaining a natural result for her in the frontal view, uh, which she was very happy with. And then compared to this patient, this is a male, um, again, has a bit of a dorsal hump. He had a, a droopy tip. And, uh, you know, I just want to emphasize in males, we approach a little different that you really try to avoid a scooped out appearance. You want a very um, straight dorsum and uh, definitely want to avoid upturning the tip too much. Um, and uh, we're able to accomplish that with him. And he also had a, a crooked nose, um, which we're able to straighten out uh, and improve his breathing at the same time. So this brings me to functional rhinoplasty. So that's rhinoplasty for trouble breathing through your nose. Um, this, unlike cosmetic rhinoplasty, can be covered by insurance, and we can always look at that. Uh, there's some common causes. I'm going to go over each of these. The, the three most common causes are collapse of either the internal or external valve, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, there can be septal deviation, which is a you know, common term that a lot of people are aware of. And probably one of the most common, but uh, less aware, 
uh, among our patients is inferior turbinate hypertrophy. So the top, top of this slide pretty much shows the view that we see when you come to the clinic and we look inside your nose and it really shows the inferior turbinate and it's this mucosal outpouching on this, the side of your nose and it's, it really serves an important function. It both humidifies and warms the air that we breathe so we don't want to cut it out completely but we do want to downsize it when it's too large as you could see here and it could be obstructive. So we use a surgical device called a microdebrider which allows us to preserve the mucosa and therefore its function while downsizing it and getting it out of the way for your airway. And I often do this on cosmetic rhinoplasty and it, and it helps as a side benefit to help improve their breathing while we're at it. Um, the other causes of uh, nasal obstruction are, uh, uh, that's common is the septum here. That's the cartilage in the middle of your nose which can deflect, you know, it could be C-shaped, S-shaped, or, or any direction, um, and uh, basically um, cause obstruction of one or both your nostrils. And the last two um, that we look at is the external valve. The external valve is really, you can consider it your nostril. And sometimes if you breathe in, you could even try this at home uh, in the mirror. If you breathe in uh, with your nose, you could see sometimes some people collapse, their nostril collapses and that's uh, external valve collapse. And then the internal valve is really the junction between the upper lateral cartilage and the lower lateral cartilages, which are, these are just the, some of the cartilages uh, in your nose. And that's a point of constriction in your nose as well that often does collapse as well. And we surgically support that with cartilage and, and help your breathing. Um, this is an example of a patient uh, of mine that uh, came in with, with all the three of these symptoms. Uh, had bad, uh, couldn't breathe through his nose at all. Um, you could see it was really deviated and collapse of his nostril there on the right side. And we're able to straighten out that out for him um, and improve his breathing uh, without changing the appearance of his nose. So this brings me to open versus closed rhinoplasty. These are two major categories of, of rhinoplasty that are performed. So open rhinoplasty really means that you basically put through incision through that middle skin bridge between your nostrils we're able to peel back the skin of your nose and really see everything going on. So that's the, the benefit is it gives you better visibility as a surgeon. And it, I think for me, basically, you know, I use it whenever I need to do extensive tip work. So whenever someone really needs to change the appearance of the tip of their nose, um, it's, it's a great procedure. Um, or if it's a difficult revision case where I don't know what's been done before, it's important to see what, what's going on with the anatomy, then, then the open approach is preferred. Um, and, and, I, and I really put visible scar here in, in quotations because it's, it's rarely visible. Um, I've never had a patient unhappy with it, but still it's, it's a, a, a point um, that's important to some people. And you know, with closed rhinoplasty, basically you're able to avoid that external scar and all the incisions are inside the nose. Um, and um, you know, this is a, if someone comes in, especially just for nasal airway obstruction or for the functional rhinoplasty, then I often do the closed uh, rhinoplasty ap approach. And for aesthetic reasons, if they don't need a lot of tip work, then I think it's a great approach as well. And I'm just gonna show you an example. This is an example of a patient of mine that had a open rhinoplasty. And again, it's just nearly impossible to see the, the scar. And I think most people don't walk around with their head tilted up like that anyways. Um, but here's just a, a diagram showing the difference between the open and closed. And that's the scar I'm talking about. And this is the view, the surgeon's view that we get that allows us to peel back the skin and get a good look at really the tip, which is the most important, and really shape that and be very precise with the tip when we need to be. Here's another view of the same patient. Again, uh, very difficult to ever see the scar. Um, and just wanted to point that, point that out. So that brings me to primary versus secondary rhinoplasty. And secondary rhinoplasty, again, is really another term for revision rhinoplasty. On average, about 5% of rhinoplasties, depending on the surgeon, um, require revision. Um, and there's challenges with, with uh, revision rhinoplasty. There's a lack of nasal cartilage. Um, we use your own nasal cartilage often, that, that septum, to really shape and support your nose. Um, and that is, that's an important point um, that in the secondaries, if that's no longer available, we have to go to another source when we need it. And the most common are the ear or the rib. Um, there's also a lot of scar tissue when you're doing a, a revision rhinoplasty, which makes it a, a lot more difficult and um, increases the chance for, for um, uh, certain risks such as vascular compromise. Um, and, and lastly, we, we don't ever know what's done before unless we did it ourselves, um, which just increases the difficulty of the procedure and sometimes they can take longer and be more challenging. 
So I want to go over like, some of the modern techniques, and this is some of the research I've been uh, involved with. But really, um, historically, rhinoplasty initially was surgeons were just trying to downsize the nose. And to do that, they were destroying a lot of the uh, anatomic cartilage that, that is uh, in your nose. Uh, and that would result in deformities like this. This one's called the inverted V. And basically, the um, upper lateral cartilages of your nose, um, which is diagrammed here, uh, collapse um, over time under the scar tissue pressure. And it causes a visible deformity. And it, it, um, the patients often can't breathe through the nose um, after this this uh, issue. So over time, we've learned to really, really what we want to do is maintain your natural cartilage um, and shape it, use it to shape your nose better and maintain the support of your nose. And that's some of the research we did here um, that allowed us to um, really imp um, still improve the shape of your nose, but still maintain, maintain that shape over time and also improve your breathing at the same time. And, and it helps us also get a more natural result, really, by preserving the anatomy and this is an example from that study um, I was involved with of a patient, uh, again, you know, can really see that we avoided any inverted V deformity and gave her a nice profile at the same time. And there's another brand new device that I'm, that I'm excited about that, um, you know, I, th I think it will have a great role in rhinoplasty. And, and the reason is I think it can really shorten the downtime and cause less bruising and swelling. And this is an ultrasonic device, meaning basically uses ultrasound waves to cut only bone. This device was initially developed for neurosurgery, but we're able to apply for rhinoplasty where you need um, a high degree of precision as well with, with uh, cutting the bone. And it can only cut the bone, not, not the soft tissue. Historically, we've used basically a hammer and chisel um, to uh, cut bones when, when necessary for uh, rhinoplasty. And, and this is basically a new, de new device that um, is uh, very, um, uh, very precise and only can cut the bone and it, it basically uh, decreases any chance for collateral damage to the uh, surrounding soft tissue. Um, and, and this is a, a study I was involved with uh, basically um, testing this, uh, this device in, uh, in uh, five patients. So this is an example from that study of a patient that we brought in her nasal bones um, and uh, you know she had minimal bruising after the procedure and, and uh, a shorter downtime really. So um, is rhinoplasty right for you? So, so what, are the, what are the things that we need to consider? So number one, we've got to make sure that you're in good health. You've got to be healthy. We've got to make sure the surgery is safe before even considering it. Then you want to be at least over the age of 16. It could be a little less for females and a little more for males. But basically, we want to make sure that you're, you're no longer, your nose is no longer uh, growing because we don't want a uh, moving target. So you should complete nasal growth before considering the surgery. We also have to make sure that you're a non-smoker. Smoking clogs those small blood vessels that supply, supply the um, skin of your nose, and smokers can have disastrous complications um, that we really want to avoid uh, you know, whenever possible. So we make sure that any smoker has been away from cigarettes or any secondhand smoke for about six weeks before the operation and six weeks after the operation. And then the other common reasons that people consider rhinoplasty is that they just feel like their nose doesn't fit their face or their nose is either uh, misshapen or, or crooked uh, from prior trauma. Or you just may have trouble breathing through your nose and you don't want to change their appearance at all. And that's, that's another reason that you should consider rhinoplasty. So what are the most common questions I get among my patients? Um, everyone wants to know how long does a, is a procedure. And, and this is a difficult question to answer because it really depends on nose. Just, just like I said that just no nose, um, there's no one treatment for any nose, um, as every face is different, every nose is different. So sometimes people just want to bring in the nostrils, um, and that's a short procedure we could do in the clinic that takes less than an hour. Uh, but a complicated secondary case can take four to five hours. So I would say most primary rhinoplasties, um, on average, are two to three hours of operative time. Um, and uh, that's, that's a good average number. How much pain will you have? I usually get the response that most patients are surprised how little pain they had. We always give pain medications, uh, but most of them use, it, use them for about a day or two, and then, and then um, it's not considered one of the most uh, painful surgeries we do in, in cosmetic surgery. What's the recovery time like? Um, basically, you'll have nasal bandages on for the first week after the operation. After that, um, you know, we'll get the bandages off, and it's all about the swelling. So, it takes about 
six weeks before most of that swelling is gone and you'll be happy with your nose at, at that point. Um, but it takes much longer for all the, the swelling to go away. I'd say at three months you're about 90-95% of the way there and won't really notice dramatic changes after that. Um, but the swelling still subsides over the course of a year and will vary depending on your, on your diet. If you have a high salt diet, for instance, uh, the swelling can go up. Um, so we try to avoid that after the surgery. How much time off of work or school would, do most uh, patients take? Most patients don't want to walk around with nasal bandages, so we recommend a week. But if you're going to work from home, for instance, or you're going to try to do homework, most patients feel up for it after a couple of days. You let the anesthesia wear off, you're off pain medications, and um, you're able to get, get uh, work done at that point. When can you work out again? Um, so in terms of working out, the first two weeks after the operation, you really want to avoid getting your heart rate or blood pressure up. After that, um, it's really about any mechanical stress to your nose. So I recommend doing things like um, the stationary bike, for instance, after the two weeks, and you can start gently exercising and seeing how your body's tolerating it. You want to avoid also any, any um, uh, maneuvers uh, that would have your head down. Um, so things like doing a lot of push-ups or anything like that, you want to avoid for at least six weeks. And then at six weeks, you could um, gently start uh, you know, a more rigorous regimen. Um, how much does a rhinoplasty cost? Again, um, that really depends on what we're doing. If we're going to do a small procedure in the clinic, um, such as just bringing your nostrils, then that's a couple thousand dollars. Um, but uh, you know, most primary rhinoplasty, the, the surgeon's fee is about $8,000. Um, and then you add a couple thousand dollars for the anesthesia and the surgery center time. Um, and uh, secondary, difficult secondary procedures can be more than that if we have to get ear or rib. Uh, could bump it up to about 10000 But do remember a lot of these can be covered by insurance and when they're covered by insurance, um, but you also want to uh, cosmetic uh, rhinoplasty and change something about the appearance of your nose, then we kind of reduce our surgical fees to about a couple thousand dollars or $3,000 uh, or so um, out of pocket uh, expense and the rest would be covered by insurance. So it really does vary quite a bit, but I was just trying to, uh, this is a common question, give you a ballpark figure. Um, can it be combined with other procedures? A lot of times we have patients come in for rhinoplasty, they're going to be under anesthesia anyway, and they have another concern. And, and as a plastic surgeon, you know, again, we, we try to address the whole face, whether you need a chin implant. And I'm just going to show an example of a recent patient uh, came in for a functional rhinoplasty, but also wanted facial rejuvenation, um, gave her a, a facelift at the same time, corrected her breathing. Um, that was covered by insurance. And then we just um, uh, charger for the uh, uh, facelift, but it was all done under the same anesthesia, and um, she uh, was a very happy patient. Um, and uh, this result is actually only 10 days out, um, you know, so she uh, she did well. Um, so what are the main takeaways? Again, different noses require different techniques. Um, there's no uh, one size fits all. Um, we can improve the your appearance of your nose and your nasal breathing. Um, and uh, with modern techniques, the results really should look natural. Um, it shouldn't look done. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any other questions, please refer to uh, the UCLA Post Surgery website or drjasonpostsurgery.com. If you have, um, uh, if you want to come in for a consultation, you can also call in at uh, 310-825-8827 or book online. Uh, be happy to see you. And now I'm going to uh, answer a couple of questions that we got from the uh, Twitter. <coughs> Okay, so, so the first question is, what should I think about if I have a rhinoplasty? So it's, it's a, I try to touch upon a lot of that in this talk as far as what are the, some of the main takeaways. I think, um, number one, uh, you want to have a good idea of why you're having the rhinoplasty done. Um, whether if it's something about the appearance of your nose that bothers you, or is it for your breathing, or is it for both? Um, so really try to identify why you're having the surgery done um, and, and really it's all about the communication with your surgeon. You want to communicate and really get across um, you know, what you're trying to achieve. And when you, guys, when you and your surgeon can see eye to eye and, and really understand each other, that's when we have the happiest patients and are able to deliver the best results. So that's, that's my recommendation for that question. What are the risks of rhinoplasty? Um, Generally, I'd say that the most common risk is to be unhappy with the result, honestly. Um, it's, uh, the, the risks are pretty low in general. Things, common surgical risks such as excessive bleeding, uh, infection, um, or you know, kind of 
you know, disastrous complications like, you know, poor scarring, all that, they're very, very rare in, in rhinoplasty, actually. Um, the most common thing is that someone is just unhappy with the appearance of their nose, and that's, you know, a lot of times that we have that 5% revision rate, I think it has to do with not having good communication on the front end, and the surgeon uh, maybe not understanding what the patient was trying to achieve exactly, uh, and then being unhappy with the result. Um, so most of the revisions we do uh, is often for patients that you know, are just unhappy with some aspect of their rhinoplasty. So I would say that is the most common risk. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, you know, the other small things that can change your, uh, you know, your breathing in general should get better. But at times, if you know, depending on how the surgery was done and there wasn't adequate support, like I was trying to emphasize, sometimes your breathing could get worse. Um, and uh, I think I think that's that's those are the most common risks. Uh, who's a good candidate for cosmetic rhinoplasty? I think anyone who can really identify what bothers them about their nose, um, and and if you know, it, and it's and it, it it in both you and your surgeon can see it. So if it, you know, on a profile view, if you have a hump that bothers you, and that's that's very fixable, um, and having realistic res, uh, expectations, um, you know, you should should go be going for an improvement in whatever bothers you, and not necessarily always perfection is you know. We are, I am a perfectionist and try to always get as perfect a result as possible, but I think going in with just an expectation of getting an improvement, you'll, you will be happy. Um, how can I prevent bruising after nose surgery? Um, so, so a couple things, uh, we really try to um, have you in the first couple days stay upright as much as possible, use gravity to your favor. Um, that decreases the swelling. In terms of bruising, you also want to, sometimes we have you use ice water soaked uh, gauze uh, or cool packs on, on the sides of your nose. Because um, most of the bruising you see is right around the eye. So um, we really try to get those blood vessels to uh, clamp down and uh, decrease your chance for bruising uh, through those methods. Um, what should I look for in a good nose job surgeon? I think look for someone that actually specializes in rhinoplasty and does a fair number. Um, or as um, special training just in rhinoplasty. Um, I did an aesthetic fellowship in uh, Dallas, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's where some of the uh, leaders of the field um, uh, teach. And, um, you know, so I, I was fortunate to have that experience, and um, it's given me a lot of uh, um, extra expertise I wouldn't have had otherwise. So I think try to go to someone that, that is comfortable doing it um, and does a, a fair number of these surgeries. Uh, that's all the questions I have uh, for you so far, um, and uh, look forward to maybe meeting you in the future and, and talking more about uh, rhinoplasty. Thanks so much.